Welcome to the Deep Impact Investing Podcast with Kimberly Griego-Kyle of Horizon Sustainable Financial Services. In this podcast, we discuss sustainable impact investing, creating portfolios that match your values, and a variety of other topics such as financial education, social justice, and sustainable food systems. Do you want to know if your investments seek the kind of accountability from corporations that you demand? Listen in as we explore the burning question, are you investing like you give a damn? Hello and welcome to Deep Impact Investing with Kimberly Grego Kyle from Horizon Sustainable Financial Services. Kim, how are you? I'm good. We got snow today. Oh, and that and you're still good? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm tired. Well, of it. you know, yeah. you know I don't really like the cold, but um, in case our listeners do hear this, our, we have a great Pyrenees, right? You've talked about that. Oh, yes. Yeah. So she's almost eight months old now and she's outside barking. So we may hear her, but oh, yeah. she loves the snow. Oh, that's I keep fantastic. catching her rolling around in it. It's quite adorable. <laughs> so, but that we didn't, we're not here to talk about my dog. <laughs> yeah. And your dog is not the only guest on the podcast today. Who did you bring on? Okay. So yes, I do have a really, really exciting guest. Today, we're going to talk with Vicki Benjamin, and let me just tell you a bit about her because what she does is super interesting, and she's a very fascinating person. She's the co-founder of, uh, well, co-founder and CEO of uh, Carner Blue Capital, and they do something very unique in this industry because, of course, we're going to talk about impact investing today, mm -hmm. but um, Vicki started this company in 2017. She's the majority owner. She, and she has a long, long history in the sustainable investment world. She previously worked at Calvert, and I think most impact investors recognize that name. Mm -hmm. So she worked at Calvert Investments as the CFO and the COO, and a couple of other super fascinating places too. But I don't want to talk about Vicki all day. I want Vicki to talk to us. So welcome. Thank you, Kim. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, thank you, Eric, as well. And uh, love hearing about the dog, as uh, yeah. <laughs> as you can imagine, because it fits right into what I do. And right. we do I at mean, Carner Blue Capital. Exactly. And, and our Pyrenees is out there, actually, to protect. She's a livestock guardian dog, so she's protecting our goats and chickens. That's wonderful. So, That's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's start here. Why don't you tell us, you know, the listeners how you made this decision to start Carner Blue and, and really, well, we'll take a deep dive into what you do, but let's, let's start there. Great. Thank you. Um, well, it, it, it's quite easy. Uh, I looked around back in t the end of 2016. Uh, I had decided to leave Calvert, uh, not move over with the sale of its business. Mm -hmm. And Myself and the general counsel of Calvert, Andrew Niebler, looked around in the investment management workplace, uh, product place, and noticed there were not strategies focused on nature. So, yeah. and we and we recognize that even then, back in 2017, climate change investing was fairly nascent. We had just started, ESG was just coming into vogue, if you will, or mainstream, had just started being socialized. And there's gender investing, there's fair trade yep. investing, there's yep. overall ESG products, but nothing focused on the big E, the environment and or nature. Right. It, and so, and this oh, is, go ahead. I, I just want to say this is so important because what we're really talking about here, um, well, you can finish your story, but we'll, you know, what we're really talking here is about focusing on the natural environment, right? Absolutely. So a lot of folks, especially in the U.S., and I think that's because we have a different history. Um, we have different issues we're dealing with in Europe. Europe is is far ahead of us on environmental mm. um, issues and challenges. So if, if you step back, the U.S. populace is not that educated about nature, dependencies, impacts, risks, opportunities. And in that little space of, in that very big space of nature, 
ecosystem services, and biodiversity. So that's the primary reason you haven't seen investment management pro um, products out there. And let me just say, just to give you a little understanding of the impact and the, our dependency on nature, virtually half of the global GDP of $54 trillion is dependent on nature and natural services. So, wow. I just want yeah. to say, Vicki, that is so fascinating. I don't think you're right. Most people don't recognize that. And if we don't pay attention to that 50%, we're going to have a problem. A big problem, Kim, a big problem. So just for example, one that I, I, I certainly was surprised is 4 billion people, not quite half, are dependent on holistic medicine. We in the oh. developed world think, oh, everyone, you know, is like, you know, pharmaceuticals, we have access to drugstores. For virtually half the world is dependent on flora and fauna for their medicine. That is also another interesting fact. And um, Eric, if you have questions on these facts, please jump in because I know you're a fact guy. Um, yeah, I'm just blown away. I just. Uh, right? <laughs> So you created this company to address these particular issues. I did with Andrew. And right. given, given what was amazing to me, so in conjunction with climate change, and these, the statistics, I'm, I can give you the reports that they came from, and yeah. they're relatively new. It's important. These reports are, are about a year, year and a half old. So if you add climate change together with biodiversity loss, it, you have right now 80% of biodiversity loss threatened, our species are threatened by three socioeconomic systems. So let me, let me just say that again, uh, out yeah. of, uh, out of um, together with climate change, three socioeconomic systems are responsible for, for 80% of our biodiversity loss. So that doesn't really mean anything until you contextualize it. Right now, 25% of all plant and animal species are threatened with extinction, 25%. I'm actually well, surprised that's not a little higher, personally, but I think that will shock some people. Uh, you're right, you're right. Um, I, I, I think, but when we're talking threatened with extinction, and that's in this decade. Hmm. So, and a lot of them, and I, and, and I just want to go for a little bit further, one more statistic, one million species are at risk of total uh, extinction. So wow. that one million species, uh, because there's not that many species that they've cataloged, one million species it represents a lot of our iconic animals. So the Sumatran orangutan, of which there's approximately 8,000. Mm. They're in the way of palm oil. Um, the Sumatran tiger and also the elephant. It is, and the rhino. It is uh, theorized that... Those four species, the only place left on Earth that they coexist is in the Luwuzer, northern Sumatra um, ecosystem. And mm -hmm. that because of palm oil and the encroachment from palm oil plantations, those four species are, uh, are red listed and uh, almost on the brink of extinction. Oh, all of us know tigers, rhinos, and right. elephants. Right. Yes. So, I, I would I want to just say these are horrendous statistics, and mm -hmm. I I don't think a lot of folks realize that so many of these animals and the flora and fauna are in distress. So, as we have talked about this, and you've shared, what we're really talking about here is some worst case scenarios. So let's turn it around a little bit and talk about why investing in a more natural uh, process in public markets, how are we going to make a difference to all these horrible 
happenings? So the World Economic Forum came out with quite a transformative study that three socioeconomic systems, um, that's food and agriculture, including fishing, uh, infrastructure, including utilities and buildings, and um, extractives, metals and mining, oil and gas, are responsible for 80% of nature loss. Mm. So up until now, all the work of the NGOs and the governments and individual consumers have not been able to fund the gap, which is what we call nature is disappearing faster than we can conserve it and protect mm-hmm. it using traditional methodologies. So what was so important about the World Economic Forum is they said, hey, we're not getting it done with what, what we're doing now. We're not getting it done with governmental exercises and conservation. We're just not. Right. It's what not is, enough. It's not enough. And especially if it's not enough with a constant status population right now, how will it ever be enough with a population growth that we're expecting? Mm. It won't be. So what we have to do is create a, we recreate our natural infrastructure. And the way we do that is through uh, the private sector and businesses. Mm. So, what those three sectors, food, inclusive of agriculture, extractives and infrastructure, need to be transformed. They need to change the way that they're operating. And rapidly, and, I would add. And rapidly, rapidly. We have this decade. Uh, climate change, you know, we've been pitter-pattering around for climate change for 40 years. We finally are doing something. It's exciting. We don't have that kind of runway with nature loss. We we really need to have a call to action and we need to act. Yeah. So that's I just why wanna, I started Carnival. We started Carnival Capital. Right. And I just want to add to that piece uh, the reason we don't have this kind of leeway time, or as you said, the runway for it is because we did ignore climate change for so long. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, when you look at nature loss and biodiversity loss, there's five drivers. So uh, there's habitat destruction, which includes deforestation and uh, overfishing, and then climate change. And as I said earlier, the two of those represent about 80%, 70 to 80% Mm. of the loss of species. And then you have invasive species introduction, and then you have other types of pollution like runoff into the ocean where there is, that's a very large contributor to loss of ocean life. And then you also have um, exploitation, which is probably the most known about. So exploitation of animals, a lot of people don't think about it this way, but uh, you think about it as trophy hunting and Ugh, the worst know, we don't right it's awful we don't have a lot of exposure to trophy hunting through the capital markets so but there's other ways companies are exposed to endangered species so for instance you know you go into i'll go back to palm oil because all of those iconic species people can realize understand it um, yes very relative yeah rel- relative and so when you're building, you're putting in a plantation of palm oil, you are in direct conflict, direct conflict with these animals. And I'm not going to go into the gory details of how that conflict transpires and what happens. Well, but- we've talked about some of that on a previous podcast. I did a, a podcast um, on palm oil. And oh, I gosh, think, I, could tell, know, I, I should send you so many papers. I'm working on a special project. <laughs> uh, oh, that'll be interesting. Tanks. Yes, yeah. yes. Oh, can't wait for that. Anyway, I didn't mean to interrupt you. So, But the, that conflict can, can can transmit into bushmeat policies of, of large companies, how many animals are hurt in this conflict. And there's a lot of, of, of other things. That, there's other ways other than trafficking that animals are exploited through the corporate, uh, the corporate business operations. 
So that, that was one thing I, I, I wanted to mention is that you have to look at the drivers of biodiversity loss and how those relate to the capital markets and then those three specific sectors. So if we talk specifically, well, we, we don't have to mention any companies, but if you're working with a company or you're thinking of investing in a company uh, into your portfolio, what are the steps that you're taking to look at these issues? So it's, um, we start out with a global index, a Morningstar Development Market Index. We're in uh, SRI, ESG firm. So we strip out all uh, public companies that have, you know, uh, the traditional sin companies, right? So right. gambling, um, tobacco, firearms. We also have no uh, exposure to coal. We have no exposure to palm oil plantations. We have no exposure to fur. Anything that has an alternative. We, we do have palm oil exposure. We just don't have exposure to palm oil plantations. And we've stripped those out. And then the companies that are remaining... Those in the high impact industries, which are subsectors of those three socioeconomic industries that I mentioned previously, have individual models, Kim, that evaluate each company in that industry that's, a, that's above a certain ESG score and benchmarks it against others in their industry. That. That's good. And I want to I want to pause and, and just say on this, you, your process, your due diligence process in this creation of your portfolios is where we really see this impact in investing, because it's not just a cursory screening. You're really looking at the details in here. We are. And um, we've so if you want to talk a little bit you understand the why and you understand the how uh, it's, it's very labor intensive because companies don't report much data. And so we have to work with NGOs, call the companies to understand their true natural impact. And because of the dearth of data, we partnered with a group out of France, Iceberg Data Labs, who is in conjunction with a couple of others, including B BMP, Paribas, and Sycamore Asset Management, we partnered with them in a consortium to fund their research on company biodiversity impacts because it's so important to understand and contextualize a company's impact on nature. So. Yes, it is. And I... I I just was thinking while you were talking about that. I don't mean to laugh because this is serious, but oh, no, yeah, yeah. I would um, love to do that work. And some people might think it's tedious, but I would love to actually be one of those people who's calling these companies or these not NGOs and trying to extract this data. Um, as depressing as it sometimes is, the data, oh, how much fun that would be. Oh, it, it's, there is never a boring day. And what is so amazing, Kim, and when you get, when you we've really come full circle as to why there is no products is because it's so time consuming to evaluate and benchmark companies and their impacts. So mm. a lot of products in this space, ESG space, are packaged using automated data sources, right? Right. And so if it's not reported by companies, it's not picked up by these automated data sources. And so investment managers can't put together products. So starting in 2017, we worked with some folks that we knew from Calvert that were no longer there and built models and built a system, a process, if you will, of how to evaluate and benchmark companies on this issue on the front end. Oh, so you created your own process. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a lot of work and, and crazy. It is. I, I would think. 
Well, but, that's why it's so great that icebergs on the scene now and companies will have once it's it's done we'll have a a a, a, da- a data source for biodiversity right. impacts that is super fascinating it's exciting and it's exciting it is exciting yeah and i i get very excited about that stuff wanting to really know what these corporations are doing and mm-hmm. and how to push them forward to get a better result and hopefully stop this desecration of our animals and our flora and our fauna. It's, it's a, a very tense time. And I, I applaud you for all this work that you're doing. Thank you. I just, just so that, you know, um, we have really, so for instance, right. When we talk about data, that's not reported publicly, deforestation in the ag industry is the number one driver of loss, biodiversity loss. I mean, you also have climate change, GSG emissions, but deforestation, but companies don't report. They report their policy on deforestation, but we don't know how many acres per dollar of capital they are destroying. We don't know where those acres are. And without that kind of data and understanding the species abundance of the areas they're impacting, you really don't know their impact. So we're also encouraging companies through advocacy to do better reporting. That's great because this is a a perfect example of why it's hard to really find out what's happening on the ground and what the impact is. We have to have more options for that. I think we could talk about this all day, but you mentioned to me, I know we could, It's, it's really interesting to me. And you were talking the other day about a new asset class and I wanna, talk to you about that because I read some of the articles you sent me and this very much relates to the work that you're doing at Carner Blue. It does. It does. It's, it's very exciting. It's another, so if you look at Carner Blue investing in large cap, big cap, you know, public companies and their impact and trying to evaluate their impacts on nature and to encourage changes in operating protocols And then you look at the work of great organizations like the Nature Conservancy that are using conservation efforts. And then you look at some countries that are working to, you know, save and conserve 30% of their oceans or 30% of their lands or or whatever. And you understand those are all great, right? But we need something a little bit more because what we're doing, the capital markets aren't going to move fast enough. You know it, I know it, everyone knows that. I'm really excited, Kim, about natural asset capital companies because they're another way of conserving nature, uh, monetizing the value of nature, and allowing retail investors to participate in conservation. So let me explain a little bit what it what it's Please. about. Yes, it's this is very new, and so I'm super excited about the opportunities, but tell us the details. So what they're basically doing is looking for land or, or, and it can be leased or owned, looking for property that generates ecosystem services. So ecosystem services uh, can be carbon sequestration, water filtration, canopy cover, Etc. All the things that wonder the ecosystem does for us gives us the air that we breathe, provides um, heat absorption, etc. Right, the water we drink. Exactly. They then have this group out of out of D.C. Uh, headed by a, a wonderful, innovative, transformative man, Douglas Eager, at the Intrinsic Exchange Group (IEG), has come up with a way of accounting for these ecosystem services, such that the value of this property, leased or owned, can be valued, can be assessed using accounting techniques. So if you can take this asset and the services it provides, which previously have been intangible, nobody's been able to value nature. That's why we're, I think, right. a lot of the reason we're in the mess we're in. So then they, they, they assign a value to it, they account for a value to it, and then it's almost like a SPAC right? They, uh, a SPAC or a special purpose company will come out, value the land, acquire it, wrap it, and go public with it. So 
Vicky, let's put this into a, maybe a one or two sentence, easy understanding way for mm-hmm. the listeners. This is okay. my understanding and you can correct me. If So these particular natural asset capital investments, companies, mm-hmm. companies, sorry, are taking the nature on a piece of land, mm-hmm. looking at the data, and then turning that into a dollar figure mm-hmm. on the effects, the negative effects on that property, correct? Nope, the, po- the, the positive <laughs> effects. So the positive effects, you- okay, I was close. So that was the thing I missed. Okay, so it's they're looking at the positive effects. Great, got it. So it's much like, well, I'm going to give you a very simple example. You have a, a park that provides, let's just say all it does is it provides beauty, uh, uh, an intangible asset for people that walk through it. Somehow you can actually determine how much that is worth, uh, that beauty to uh, perhaps charge admission to that and sell it as, package it and sell it as an IPO. What, what, that's, that, you're using that. That is some of the the. So just so you know, this has been. Um, we're looking for the listing standards with the New York Stock Exchange. They've this is so brand new. It came out in November, really, right. um, of last year. We're waiting for the listing standards. We hear the rumblings that there's one coming to market uh, with the asset itself, the land based in Costa Rica. And you really just need to think that it's as simple as finding a, 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 a product, a, a, a property that generates services to the surrounding land or people, the surrounding inhabitants, and valuing those and determining how those that value is translated to the people that use it, how, how it is how it is paid for by the people that use it, mm-hmm. and then finding folks that will invest in it. I am so excited about the opportunities around this. And I, I, I'm sad Johan's not here because I think he'd have a million questions on that. But then we'd also run out of time and we are close. <laughs> so we're going to have to talk more about this because I know – a lot of our clients are going to be incredibly interested in these. There's a lot of, there's a, since it's, it hasn't, they haven't launched yet. I think the NYSE is probably struggling with the listing standards because you have so many valuation issues, right? We've never valued ecosystem services before. So how are we going to value them, put a terminal value on the property itself, how is it going to trade in the markets? Um, it's very much like a very illiquid instrument, but yet it's going to be priced every, you know, on the markets. It's going to be right. a public uh, instrument. So there's a lot. It's it's so exciting, and there's a lot coming out on it. I wish I had more details, but uh, well, it's evolving. Yeah, and we'll have to talk about that uh, maybe on another podcast. And also, when they when they are really fully active, we're, we are running out of time, and, and I know we had wanted to talk about another big topic. So I'm hoping you'll come back soon, and we can finish that conversation and really talk about our other big question. Um, yes. So I really want to say thank you very much for providing all this information and not only laying out the problems, but how we can solve them. Uh, or work towards solving them in in everything that you do. And a, a, a note for our listeners as well, Vicki and Andrew also have uh, an individual stock account uh, through Folio that we use for some of our clients in our in our individual folios. And it's amazing. So we're happy to have her doing that. Any last words, Vicki? I think... Uh... I'd, lo- I'd love to read a quote, if that would be okay. Yes, that would be great. I would like to end on a hopeful note. Not all is lost here, Kim. Uh, yes. We have the ability to change this. We have a decade to do it. And I am 
so encouraged because climate change and biodiversity loss are so interconnected. And the progress we've made just in one year on climate change gives me so much hope that we're going to be able to fix this. And I just want people to feel empowered. So, um, and understanding that there are folks out there that are working to value nature, make it accountable to people that use it, use it irresponsibly. And there's a lot going on. So, um, we're going to save those orangutans and we're going to save yes. those tigers and we're going to save those elephants so our children and our children's children can enjoy them. Excellent and so passionate and I really appreciate that. I just want to mention to our listeners, if you want to see your money make this kind of an impact and you're really passionate about any of these issues, to please call us. You can reach the office at 505-982-9661 or email info at horizonssfs.com. Eric, do you have any burning questions you want to throw in there real quick? Not any questions, really, but but Vicki, as you were really beginning this conversation, something (laughs) popped into my mind I haven't thought about in a very long time, and that was uh, the movie Medicine Man. Uh, that came out 30 years ago, and that's with Sean Connery, and he was a scientist and all that. And, and so just a glimpse of my age, that was actually my senior year in high school when that movie came out. Oh, I remember watching it. Now we it. know how old you are. Exactly. <laughs> and I, I thought about it, and I was like, you know, when you were talking about the flora and the fauna and how many people around the world, the percentage of people that use flora and fauna as medicine – that movie illustrates perfectly, and, and I hate the fact that it was 30 years ago, and it, it feels to me like we haven't made a whole lot of progress, which I know there's so many people fighting the good fight like you and like Kim and like so many others, but once it's gone, it's gone, and that's kind of the message it's of gone. that movie. Yeah. Once it's gone, it's gone, whether that's flora, fauna, animals, whatever, and, and we're doing this to ourselves. And so I, I just that was kind of mulling around in my head, and I, I love the fact that you guys are both so passionate about what you do. So thank you so much for being a guest on the show today. Yes. Thank Thank you you very much. I was just going to say one quick thing. I'm sorry. I just want to thank the listeners for their interest and their support and their desire to be involved in impact investing. So their dedication, our dedication is what will change the world. Yep, absolutely. Again, Vicki, thank you. Kim, thank you for bringing her on the show. And our last thank you does go to you, the listening audience. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to the Deep Impact Investing Podcast with Kimberly Grego kyle If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when Kim comes out with a new podcast, it'll show directly on your listening device. This makes it really easy to share these podcasts with your friends and family. Again, thanks for listening today. For everyone at Horizons Sustainable Financial Services, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to Deep Impact Investing, the sustainable, responsible impact investing podcast that shows you how to invest like you give a damn. If you have questions about this podcast or topics you'd like to hear addressed on an upcoming podcast, email us at kim at horizons sfs.com join the conversation on twitter at horizons s u s t f i n or give us a call at 505-982-9661 don't forget to click the subscribe button to be notified when new episodes become available the companies we may speak about during our podcast are not recommendations for investment Only you and your financial advisor can determine what the right investments are for you. Horizon Sustainable Financial Services, Inc. and its financial professionals do not render tax or legal advice. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the host and or guest and does not necessarily represent the views and opinions of Horizon Sustainable Financial Services. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service providers with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. None of this content may be used or duplicated without the express written agreement of the podcast host.